you please turn to Matthew, the first chapter? He shall save his people from their sins. Ha <laughs> ha! What good news that is. He shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Could you turn to somebody and say, I'm glad I'm saved? <laughs> Tell that to the devil. First chapter, verse 19, beginning to read, Then Joseph, her husband, being a, a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. Hallelujah. A short message, but I know God put this on my heart. I don't know who it's for. I receive it from myself, and I know many of you will. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. That you have made it clear that if we depend upon you, Holy Spirit, that you will give us the words. You will make the word life. You will change hearts thereby. And I, I acknowledge my full, total dependence upon you this evening. Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence in this meeting. Thank you, Lord, that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you're always there to meet them. Lord, I give myself to you now. We want to hear from your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, last Saturday uh, was the beginning of the Muslim holy days called Ramadan. And uh, I heard one of their leaders being interviewed on radio. And the, the uh, interviewer said, what is Ramadan? He said, well, I'll tell you what, he, he said, it's a time when we get together and uh, take stock of the past and we try to get back control of our lives. Get back control of our lives. In other words, the bad things that we have done, those were very words, the bad things we've done, we're trying to control the bad and bring in the good. Words to those very, that very effect. Ever since the beginning of time, after the sin of Adam, this has been man's problem. How do I get rid of my sin? How do I get rid of the dominion, the power of sin? Uh, some of you heard me tell of a young man that we took into Teen Challenge, a drug addict, into our drug program a number of years ago. And he had a big scar down his arm, and I asked him, I said, Robert, how did that happen? He said, Pastor, I got so desperate. Uh, a year ago to get free from my drug habit, a terrible heroin habit he'd had for 10, 15 years. And he said, I, I made all kinds of promises. I'd lock myself in a room for two or three days. And every time I'd look at that needle track, every time I look at the track, I, I, I got tempted and I would go and a thought hit me. He said, I don't know whether it's from the devil or what. If I could just burn off that track, I maybe would be distracted and not shoot drugs anymore I wouldn't mainline and he took uh, an iron skillet an iron pan and put it on a fire stove and got it white hot and he wrapped a towel around the handle and pressed it on his flesh to burn off the tracks he screamed in such pain threw down the skillet and had to run to the pusher to get heroin to kill the pain was right back into it, bleeding flesh, and no cure. You remember the story of the drug addict I told who came running into the center, and somebody went to his apartment to help get his clothes, and they noticed on the ceiling uh, the bloody words, help, H-E-L-P. And the night before, in desperation to get rid of his habit, he had drawn blood from his own knee into his dropper 
who squirted the words help in blood on the ceiling. Anything to get rid of the burden of the dominion of sin. In, in Spain, once a year, they have a, a, pros, pros, a procession there with the flagellants. The flagellants beat themselves. They barebacked and they prayed through the streets of major cities in Spain. And also, you'll see it in Argentina, you'll see it in Brazil. The flagellants take these long whips and go moaning down the streets, whipping their backs until they're blood red. Till they bleed. They are trying to beat out. Their very words are trying to beat out their demon lusts. Trying to beat them out with these bloody flagellant strokes. Everywhere you go on the face of the earth, men are trying to get out from this curse, this bondage of the burden of sin. Paul the Apostle explained this inner battle in the seventh chapter of Romans. This, this inner battle, the things that I hate, I wind up doing. The things that I don't want to do, I wind up doing. So I, I am doing what I hate. I hate my sin, and yet I find that I'm under bondage to it. I can't break free. I don't find the resources, I don't find the power and the strength in me to break my sins. You ask any homosexual that's ever wanted to be free from a sin or a lesbian, ask them what it's like after a night of drunken indulgence. They come home and they have a conscience screaming at them. Ask them about that burden. Ask them about the shame. Ask them about the guilt. Ask them about the, the, the absolute emptiness and the sense of hopelessness. No matter what anybody would try to tell the homosexual mind, unless he's given over to his sin and completely jaded his conscience, that voice is still there, that bondage that brings such despair so that a man can't sleep, so that the drug, or the homosexual, the lesbian, has to... Uh, not every alcoholic is a homosexual, but every homosexual eventually turns to drink. To try to drown out that voice, that hounding voice, you are hooked, you can never be free, and the devil crying, you are mine. Ask any alcoholic. I um, saw an alcoholic and... Central Park on, a, on, on near 5th Avenue. Nobody could stop him. He's sitting there banging his head on the curb. 15, 20 minutes till he bleeds. And you ask him why, and somebody asks him, he, he's trying to beat out his alcoholic demon. You can't beat it out. You ask the young lady who is having an affair with a married man. She knows it's sin, she knows it's despair, she knows she could ruin not only her life, his life, and the family that's involved, and the children that may be involved. And she says, I don't ever want to do it again. We get letter after letter. One woman said, I've tried for eight years to break this. I am single, and I'm involved with a married man, and I can't break it. I cry, I scream. Another letter received on Friday from a young lady. Who's, who is the treasurer of a church, uh, just a small church. But most of the people don't know anything about finances. And she said, Pastor Wolf, she didn't give her name. I've been stealing money for 15 years from this church. I have stolen thousands of dollars. I pay my rent. I make my car payments. And she said, I can't tell you the hell that I'm in. She said, I'm in such a dilemma because I so love the pastor and they so trust me, the pastor's wife, they're dear friends. And I know it would kill them if they knew that I was a thief. And all the people that trust me, and I don't want to go to jail, and I don't have the money to repay it, and I'm in a dilemma. She wouldn't sign her name or I could have helped her. I wouldn't have paid the money. But I, I, I know there's a way out rather than suicide. She was on the brink of suicide, is thinking the only way out. She said, I'm a thief and I'm stealing and I'll probably steal more because I am used to this and I can't help myself. Th this awful dilemma of, of bondage to sin. Paul said, I find myself doing those things that I don't want to do, and what I want to do, I have no part in. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this bondage, this wretched bond, bondage that I am? Then Paul gave the answer. I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. An angel appeared to Joseph 
in a dream, saying, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. The text I just read to you, For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This little baby that's born, can you imagine... Uh, how the devil must have mocked and how he would have loved to have brought the, all the Romans of that time around that child and say, look at their God. This is the, this is going to be the Christian God, a baby. Compare that with the splendor of Rome. Compare that to the imperial palace and, and the protocol of your Caesar. Their God is a baby. I'm so glad, by the way, that he was not born a full man as the first Adam. I'm glad he was born a baby. And I'm glad he went, he was able to see the Adam nature in all of its ugliness. When he was a little child and little killed other children around were saying, mine, mine, give me, give me. Just like your kids and mine have done all their life. By the way, we had, I, this is getting off the subject for just a minute, but we had the, the elders and the pastors had a little get together with the kids. And I told you last year, if you want to get your little children, the little babies, you want to get them something, don't put anything, just give them boxes. Didn't, that's what they were doing. They were playing with all the boxes yesterday. But I, I've even noticed some of the elders' children, that's mine. Some of the godliest elders. Jesus knew what it was like. I'm so glad he was a teenager. So that no teenager here could say, well, he said he's touched with the feelings of our infirmity. He doesn't know mine. I was a teenager and he's not a teenager. He was a teenager. And all you singles, he was single. So glad he was born as a baby. Oh, they'd love to bring the Greeks and show them all the gods and their Hercules and their all of their uh, all of their gods that they worshipped and say, "Look at their god, little baby." <laughs> Didn't know that little baby would grow up one day, and one drop of that baby's blood, one drop of that man's blood, can forgive and cleanse the sins of the whole world. Mohammedans, Greeks, Romans, Jews. Hallelujah. Praise God. See, Christianity has no problem acknowledging that Jesus came to forgive sins. We have a very difficult time acknowledging that he can release us from the power of sin. He not only forgives our past sin, but he empowers us with our present and, uh, over our present and future sins. His name is Jesus, and he so delivers people from their sins. And the word here speaks of removal or separation. In other words, putting a distance between. Now, we know that he puts a distance between himself and our sins when we repent. He said he cast them over his shoulder, one prophet said, into a sea where he forgets them. They, they, they are buried with lead, so to speak. And they are dropped into the bottom of this sea of forgetfulness. God said never to be remembered. He puts distance between him and our sins. He wants to do that with your presence in no matter what your bondage is. He wants to separate you from that. He's here to save you from your sins, from the power of sin that holds you. Glory be to God. He has come to deliver us from our sins. <clears throat> Now, if, he've come, if, he, if he came to save us from our sins, it, it's only reasonable to believe that he wants nobody to die in their sins. Isn't that reasonable to deduct from this if he has come as a babe to save mankind from his sins? Then certainly it was not his will that any should perish. No one should die in their sins. He was saying, I'll tell you what, let, let, let me make that a little clearer too. Go with me to John 8, please. Eighth chapter of John. 
Now, folks, you remember the, the, the context of the scripture I'm about to give you. They bring, the Pharisees and scribes bring a woman to Jesus caught in the very act of adultery. It's always amazed me how, where, where were they that they could find her? You know, were they in some whorehouse? I mean, I just didn't. You know, when it says Jesus wrote in the sand, you know what, you, you know what he was writing? Where's the man? That's what I believe. The Bible doesn't say that, but I said it and I believe it. All these men who blame on all the women and they get off scot-free. Huh. Here, here are all these scribes. These scribes and Pharisees bring a woman taken in the act of adultery and they accuse her. And uh, look at verse 24 with me, if you will, please. Verse 23 first. And he said unto them, You're from beneath. They sure were from beneath. <laughs> Accusers. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am not of this world. I said unto you, Ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Folks, listen to me, please. I want to, I got to get something off my heart. There, there's a new phrase that's been introduced into the American vocabulary. And it's happened just this past year, especially it's coming out of Washington. It's called a loss of moral hazard. There's no more a perception of moral hazard. There's no more perception that you pay for your sins, in other words. That you can do almost anything now and there are no consequences. There's no moral hazard. In fact, that's in, if you get, if you get, yes, got yesterday, or Sunday's New York Times, there, there's an article there about, uh, the loss of perception of any moral hazard. In other words, if, if, if let's take the, uh, long-term investment firm that was rescued by the Fed recently. They were about to go bankrupt. They, they, they were gamblers. They were taking money and gambling with it in, 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 in uh, currencies. And the Fed bailed them out. And so the, the message was, and they bailed out millionaires, saving millionaires their, their huge incomes and estates. And they bailed them out. There was, there was, what these men were doing was, was, was totally out of character with morality. And now there are no consequences. They were bailed out. Let me give you another example. Now, folks, listen closely to me. You cannot be a true Christian and a lover of Jesus if you can condone what's happening in the White House. No, no clapping. I want to tell you from my heart. I, I'm telling you now, none of this should bother you. Nothing of this should get you upset. You shouldn't be railing. You shouldn't be working yourself up about it. Best thing to do is uh, don't listen to all the spinmeisters and all these people. And, and you get a one side of this about impeachment or not impeachment. But, but let me let me tell you something. If, if both Republicans and Democrats both agree in Congress and most Americans agree that what the president of the United States did was was sinful. It, it was an outright act of fornication. The acknowledgement by both Democrats and Republicans that was lying and that there was perjury. All right. There's an impeachment. And today. The president of the United States was asked by a reporter, what's impeachment like? And he smiled as broad as good. He said, it's not bad at all. It's not bad. No moral consequences. No moral hazard. Can you understand the message of that to this generation? From the CEOs, from the government... That you, it, the message is to young people, you can cheat. Eighty percent of the college students now acknowledge they cheat, and there are no consequences. 
And the whole message now to our society is that there are, there are no moral hazards whatsoever, even from the White House. The whole thing is, so what? I'm going to lick this. Folks, you don't have to worry because when, when God deals, the real problem is not adultery in the White House. And, and probably uh, a majority of the congressmen and senators uh, are throwing stones when they shouldn't be throwing stones. Uh, and, and, and many here that are saying a man maybe shouldn't, maybe shouldn't be throwing stones. But uh, uh, folks, I'm not preaching politics to you. I'm telling you as a Christian, as a believer, you can't condone sin in your life or anybody else's sin. And you can't excuse it. You've got to believe what the Bible says, that the wages of sin is death. And, and I'm telling you, it's not about adultery. It's about bloodshed. It's about 5,000 babies a day being aborted. It's because the President of the United States, I've been saying all along, over a vetoed, he vetoed abortion in the third trimester. Where they're still sucking the brains out of seven-month-old babies. That's the controversy God has. And it won't be the Congress dealing with it. It won't be the Senate dealing with it. It'll be God himself dealing not only him, but the whole nation because of a river of bloodshed. So, folks, don't work yourself up. God's got everything under control. God's doing what he's going to do. No matter what Congress says, God deals with it. But I'm telling you that my Bible says after it's appointed that a man wants to die and after that the judgment. There are moral consequences. There is a moral hazard. That moral hazard is that if you live in sin, you're going to die in sin, the Bible says. You're going to die in sin. I was studying that this afternoon in prayer and that hit me. What horror it must be for those who die in sin. You can justify it. And folks, what, what we are in for now, God help, should the Lord tarry another 10, 15 years when all these teenagers and preteens that are growing up under this, no moral hazard, no consequences for sin. And if there are no consequences, you're going to risk it. You're going to risk anything because you're not going to pay. That's the job of the church of Jesus Christ, to lift up the moral hazards. And the moral hazard is that you will stand before God and you will answer for every sin at the judgment. I don't care what they do. I don't care. Folks, listen to me. Here's, here's where it all ends. Corpus Christi played right over here. The homosexual making Jesus Christ a homosexual and having an affair with his, all of his, his disciples. Well, then if you think that's bad, listen to the news today. You know, uh, you've heard of the greatest story ever told. Now they have a play that's right now in the New York Theater Workshop called The Most Fabulous Story Ever Told. It, it's about the Hollywood Bible. The whole epic is a gay parallel. Adam and Eve become Adam and Steve, a lesbian couple. Jane and Mabel join them in paradise and provide gender parity for sexual balance. All the fantasies are from Genesis all the way to Bethlehem. They mock. This is. They, they mock the virgin birth. The play second act in the flash of the millennium puts Adam and Steve down in Chelsea. For Christmas and time to party, a gay wedding, lesbian childbirth. And if you, it says here, if you think the blue room and its nudity is something, you wait until you see the fabulous story. It's full of nudity and mockery of everything holy and divine. It's so far beyond Corpus Christi, right here in New York City. 
And then when I talk about judgment, we've got, uh, we, we even have Christians, I have pastors that mock that. Literally mock the things. No, 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 God has raised up America, it will never be judged. We are God's nation to save the world and to evangelize the world. And how anybody can think that God's going to wink at this, I, I can't comprehend. You see, these people don't believe there are any consequences. There's, there's, there's no hazard. There's no moral hazard to it at all. I can do this. And folks, if you think that most of the sinners out there aren't happy, I'm telling you, many of them have come to what is called a false peace. Remember what it says? I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my own heart. That's what the scripture said. They will, they will have a peace, a false peace come upon them right out of the pits of hell. So that no conviction can pierce it. No one can get through that. I'm so glad that I can stand in this pulpit tonight and tell you that God came down in flesh. Born as a baby in a lowly manger. And he came as the messenger of the covenant, the messenger of the new covenant. Where God said, son, you go now. And all of those who struggled for all of these many, many years trying to conquer their sins. I send you as the messenger of good news of a new covenant. That not only will I forgive the sins of those who turn to me in repentance. But I will give them the Holy Ghost to keep them from their sins. And empower them in their sins. And give them victory so that sin will no longer have dominion over their lives. That's what Christmas is all about. Freedom, deliverance from the power, the bondage of sin by covenant. <laughs> Glory be to God. I'm going to close in just a moment. But I, as, as joyful as this season is, the greatest grief for me as a pastor and an evangelist so is this thought. Jesus looked at a religious bunch, scribes who knew the law, knew the scripture, taught the scripture. And they didn't know him. And Jesus points to a religious bunch and he says, you're going to go to hell. He said, you're going to die in your sins because you don't acknowledge me. You don't receive me. You're going to die in your sins. And folks, there's no other way to put it. It's the same message. I give it to you now. In love, but in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. If you're in this church tonight, you've not brought your sins to Christ. You've not believed him to cleanse you and separate you from your sins. What he so willingly wants to do under no condition other than you come to him in simple childlike repentance and say, Jesus, it's just as though you were given an invitation to come and see the babe in the manger. and You came and knelt beside him. Folks, listen to me. That, he's making it so simple. How do you stand before God on the judgment day and answer for the simplicity of it all? How do you answer? If he tried, if he had told you to get on your hands and knees and walk from here to, Monta for, for, to Montreal or something, that would have been different. But he said, come. He said, come. Freely come. Confess and I'll receive you. I'll embrace you. And I will empower you by my spirit. I'll take you out of your prison house of adultery, fornication, homosexuality, whatever it may be. No sin is impossible with our God. No sin is impossible for the blood of Jesus Christ. He'll not only wipe your past clean, he'll give you power tonight to walk out of this building with all the power you need to face the temptation that comes against you the very next hour, the next day, the next week. There might be a battle, yes, but the Holy Ghost will be your giant there to stand beside you and your weapon against every onslaught of the enemy. I've buried enough people who died in their sins. I've walked into the room where the casket lies. And I've listened to the mourning and the groaning of the people who knew in their hearts that the person was evil and their sins had piled up against them. And when I stand there, I just, I just feel overwhelmed sometimes to look some suicide cases and some that threw their bodies away to drugs and alcohol. 
in the past 35 years buried, buried, buried so many. And that awful feeling of walking in to know that I stand, while well, I'm standing there trying to preach to those who are there and warning them lovingly that the person is not there, but standing before God, laden down with all their sins. He said, you'll die in your sins. You say, Pastor Wilson, why not a happy Christ Christmas message? Folks, you bring your sins to Jesus. It's the happiest Christmas message you'll ever get. <laughs> One last word. If you're, if you're a believer, maybe you come to this church regularly. Are you, are you willing to obey the Holy Ghost now when he whispers and tells you and gives you direction how you can get out of your mess? Are you just going to keep playing with it? Are you going to come to the new covenant and say, Lord, you made me a promise, and I don't want to make peace with this sin. I don't want to keep on with it anymore. I want that power the pastor's talking about, and I'm going to believe you tonight to endue me with this power. And I, I'm going to believe, Lord, that you're going to hear my prayer to make me sensitive to the Holy Ghost. You've got to learn Holy Ghost language. There's a Holy Ghost language that he gives to every sincere heart. And that's that still small voice, the whisper of the Spirit of Jesus Christ himself. He can deliver you and set you free tonight. Will you stand, please? Balcony, main floor, stand. <laughs> Heavenly Father, send conviction, loving conviction upon those that are here. You're not mad at anybody. You're not mad at us. You're not mad at your people. You're not mad at any sinner. You're not our judge right now, Lord. You said you are our Savior. On that day, you will be our judge. But now you come not to condemn, but to save. Lord, I pray for those in this building that are being moved upon by the Holy Spirit, the tug and the pull in their hearts. Oh, Jesus, by your precious Holy Ghost, have mercy tonight. Have mercy. If you are bound by any sin whatsoever, nobody needs to know what it is. No one will put a microphone in your face and say something silly to you. This is life and death with us. We're here to help you. Up in the balcony, go to the stairs on either side. Man, I'll turn, just get to an aisle. Come here and just stand right here. Let him, let him kneel. That's okay. Just let him stay right there. You can kneel. You can stand. Uh, but usually there's so many that come, you probably need to stand. Move in close, please. Move right up as close as you can. No one will beg you to come because the Spirit of the Lord draws you. And that's the beginning of his work. And he said, he that begun a good work in you, has begun a good work, will finish it. Obey the Holy Spirit. If you've got a lingering habit, you've got something that's just binding you, say, I want to be free at this Christmas season, and I don't want to carry this bondage anymore, I'm going to ask the Holy Ghost to teach me his voice so I can know his ways, and that he would walk me through this and out of it. Look this way, if you will, please. Everyone look up here. Uh, the young lady right here, is that your... He's with you? It's your son? He just seems so open to Jesus. He's got a smile on his face. And <laughs> Did you come to the church here? Yeah, okay. Lord bless you. I see a lot of people with uh, their handkerchiefs out. Tears won't save you, but he said that broken heart, that contrite spirit, is just opening the heart, saying, Lord, I don't want to do this on my own. I've tried... Don't you get tired of making promises and breaking them? And, and you, That's what the old covenant was about. That's what the law is all about, to show us the exceeding sinfulness of sin and how helpless we are in ourselves. You can't break your own sin. Please don't make God any more promises. Lord, I won't do it again. Lord, I promise I won't do it again. He doesn't want to hear that. He wants you to hear honesty. Say, God, I'm messing up. I I do so well for a while and I just go right back and I take a fall. First of all, you've got to know he's not angry at you. He's not mad. And he's touched with the feelings of your infirmities. The pain that you feel when you sin against him. Now, folks, look at me, please, because I'm telling you right to your heart. He knows what that pain is about. He knows all that pain. Not from sin, but he's seen it. He's touched to, with the feelings of that infirmity. But he said, if you just come to me 
and lay every care that you have, every burden, and say, Lord, I want to walk with you. I want to serve you with all my heart. I don't want to be a phony. I don't want to be a hypocrite. I don't want to put on a false front. I know I'm not where I should be, but I know that I don't want to go back to what I was. Lord Jesus, I want to grow. And I can't do it unless I believe what you said in your word. And he, he said very clearly in his word, I will give you a new heart. He has made you a promise. I will put my fear in your heart so that I will cause you to not turn away from me. I will cause you not to forsake me. And he, he said, I'll give you my commandments, everything I want you to do. I'll write them in your heart. So that you won't have to have someone try to figure it all out for you. He'll just give you a knowing what's right and what's wrong. He'll put it right in your heart. That's the Spirit of Jesus Himself. Hallelujah. That's called walking in the Spirit, walking in Christ. It's just saying, Holy Spirit, you speak to me. He won't let the devil deceive you. If you hate your sin and you say, Holy Ghost, I want you, you've got to spend quality time with Him. Don't think for a minute you can sit and watch hours and hours of television and hear the voice of God. He wants you to get alone with Him. Take the time and begin to worship Him and say, Jesus, I'm going to, I'm going to study this word, but you even have to put it in my heart. You said you put your fear in my heart. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from iniquity. By the fear of the Lord. But that fear, you can't work up. You can't get it yourself. He has to give it to you. But He'll give it to you as you pray. Prayer becomes one of the most important things of all. When you go to Him, you say, Lord, here's what you promised. You said if I confess my sins, you'll forgive me. I've confessed them. I, I accept my forgiveness. I am forgiven. I may not feel forgiven, but I am forgiven according to this book. I am forgiven. I take that by faith. You also said that if I come to you and I would believe what you said, that I could come into the new covenant, and that's an agreement God makes with you, he doesn't make with you because you make promises to him that you're going to do right. It's simply when you say, I am going to become wholly, totally dependent on the Holy Spirit in me. He said, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, I'll give you the Holy Spirit. All right, the Holy Spirit comes because you ask. Whether you feel him or not, he's there. Amen. And you just take that by faith and say, Lord, I can't do this, but I'm going to give you quality time. You are going to be my friend, my comforter, everything I, I need. That You know, Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Jesus, I will come to you again. And that's His Spirit. This Holy Ghost is the Spirit of Christ. Amen. And that's Jesus. He said, I'll, I'll walk with you. And He said, I will direct you. I'll comfort you. I'll direct you. Two young ladies uh, who, whose father just took his life recently, just heartbroken. I laid hands and said, Holy Ghost, comfort. And I could see and feel. They felt to the suddenly the Holy Spirit coming in, doing what he said he would do. It all comes down to faith. Faith. Will you believe him tonight? Will you believe what he said? Say, Lord, you, you said you're going to take away the heart of stone. You'll give me a new heart. You put your fear in my heart. You, you, you said that you'll be merciful to my sins. You'll cast them away from me. You said that you would give me power over the enemy so it would not have dominion over me. Lord, I claim that. That is, you talk about claiming your rights. That is your right to be free from the bondage of sin. Lord, I claim that. I'm not going to live the rest of my life with guilt and fear and condemnation. I know I hate my sin. That's my part. Now, Jesus, I come. I'll give you my time. I'll be in the word of God. Reading the Bible and praying, that doesn't merit anything from God other than it brings you into intimacy so that you can hear His voice. Okay? That's not complicated. Pray this prayer with me now. Jesus, I am tired and weary of trying to be holy in my strength. I am tired of trying to do right and win the victory over my problems by my own power. I quit. I surrender. I give you my sins. I give you my heart. And I stand on your word and on your promise that you give me a new heart. You put your fear in my heart and you will deliver me from the bondage of sin. And you'll teach me your commandments. 
and give me power to keep them. Love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Love on him right now. I love you, Jesus. I thank you for your holy word. I give you thanks for the holy word. Hey, look at me. You don't have to get down and beg him to do what he so willingly wants to do. Why don't you just now receive by faith? Lord, I accept by faith. I am clean. I am forgiven. Isn't there a song, I am clean? I am free is what the one I'm talking about. I am free. I am free. That's what it, I am free. Listen. If, what else can you do? Tell me. What else can you do but believe? Can anybody here give me one single word that you can do? <laughs> I must believe what he said. It comes down to faith. Now, if you've got that, just the little childlike faith. Say, Jesus, even my faith is weak. You're going to have to give me more faith. Forgive my unbelief. Take it away. Lord, teach me to believe. He'll do that for you even through prayer. God bless you. Turn around while we sing this. Shake hands with at least five people. Say, I'm free. I am free by faith. I am free. I am free.